Shabbat Shalom. Good morning and welcome. All right, this week's parsha is Yitro. And this Torah portion begins with Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, Moses' wife, and two sons visiting Moses in the wilderness near Mount Sinai. After Moses told Jethro of all that God had performed for the children of Israel in Egypt, Jethro brought a burnt offering and other sacrifices to God, for he said, Now I know that the Lord is greater than all gods. Jethro, Aaron, Moses, and the elders of, of Israel ate a meal in the presence of the Lord thereafter. In this parsha, we also see Jethro giving advice to Moses about delegating his responsibility. For it's too great a burden for Moses to judge the whole nation of Israel by himself. Moses listens to his father-in-law and chose able men to be officers over thousands, over hundreds, over fifties, and over tens. This parasha is also when the people of God first encounter God's face to face. Seven weeks after leaving Egypt, the people will arrive at Mount Sinai. God told Moses to tell the people, This is what you are to say to the descendants of Jacob, and what you are to tell the people of Israel. You yourselves have seen what I did to Egypt, and how I carried you on eagle's wings, and brought you to myself. Now, if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all the nations you will be my treasured possession. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. The Lord tells Moses to have the people go and consecrate themselves. And be ready the third day, for the Lord will come down from Mount Sinai in sight of all the people. We then read how the Lord descends on the mountain and instructs that no one except Moses should try to go near the mountain unless they perish. In the last section of the Torah portion, we see the Lord giving the Ten Commandments in the presence of all the children of Israel. God instructs Moses to tell the people, You have seen for yourselves that I have spoken to you from heaven. Do not make any gods to be alongside me. Do not make for yourself gods of silver or gods of gold. The people remained at a distance while Moses approached the thick darkness where God was. In the Haftor portion, it comes from Isaiah 6, and it speaks of the commissioning of Isaiah. It describes the vision that Isaiah saw with the seraphim hovering over the Lord who was seated on his throne. They cried out, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. Isaiah, seeing this, cries out, I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips. One of the seraphim flew to him and took a live coal from the altar and touched Isaiah's lips. He said, This has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away. Your sin atoned for. The Haftorah ends with God giving Isaiah his commission. And finally, Birch HaRashah, the New Testament portion, comes from Acts 2 and speaks of the Feast of Shavuot, which is seven weeks after the Passover or the time of year that we read about in Exodus at the giving of the Ten Commandments. This event describes the infilling of the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, into God's people as they were gathered as one in the same place. After this event, we see Peter preaching to the large crowd that had gathered outside where the disciples were saying, when he was done speaking about Yeshua and the prophecies that spoke of him in the to Tanakh, 3,000 people accepted Yeshua and were baptized. And when we need to be mindful of these readings this week is the power of community, of what happens when we gather in the same intention, with the same mind and the same heart, how you and I have a great or direct influence over the moving of the Holy Spirit even in this place when we gather, which means we have a responsibility to come to be prepared, to have no distractions, no unforgiven sins, and making sure that we are in tune with God before we walk through these doors. Amen. Shofarim.
our most holy Abba Father. Holy, holy, holy is your name. We come before you this morning, this bright Shabbat morning. Lord, we come together as your people. You've called us to come together to rest at your feet, to be obedient to your word, to listen to the sound of your voice and know that you love us. Lord, we can hear your heartbeat and your very breath. And Lord, we thank you and we praise you that you've given us this time and this place, that you've brought us together as Mishpacha to be your people, to hear of you, to learn of you, to know of you and to know that you love us. Lord, we put aside everything that encumbers us, that weighs us down, that keeps us from hearing your voice. And Lord, we lay it at your feet and allow you to take care of it today. Lord, we praise you and we worship you. And Lord, I pray that our ears would be open and our eyes would be open to the words that are going to come forth from our rabbi today. Lord, bless him. Bless the hearts of the people, Lord, to hear your words, that we would all say, Abba, Father, holy, holy, holy is your name. In Yeshua's name, we give ourselves to you today. Amen. Amen, amen. Let us stand together. For how lovely the tents of Jacob and the dwelling places of Israel. Matovu, Halecha, Yaakov, Mishkenotse, Shaft in my best of some, me manea yes you were. Shaft in my best of some, me manea yes you were. My, 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 oh my best of some, my, 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 oh my best of some. Hey, 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 oh my, 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 my best of some, my. Oh my 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 best is some shaft in my best is some me my nay I yes you were shaft in my best is some me my nay I yes you were my 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 oh my best is some my 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 oh my best is some hey hey Oh my 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 best is so my oh my 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 best is so therefore with joy we shall draw water from the wells of Yeshua amen we may be seated Shabbat Shalom we begin the Sudur with the Baruchu. Baruchu et Adonai Hamvorak, Baruch Adonai Hamvorak Leolam Va'en. The bless the Lord, the Blessed One. Blessed is the Lord, the Blessed One, for all eternity. Vashamru v'nei Israel. The children of Israel should keep the Shabbat, observing it throughout their generations as an everlasting covenant. It is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. 
This shall come to pass, that from one new moon to another, and from one Shabbat to another, all flesh shall come to worship before me, says the Lord. The blessing of the Mashiach together. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam asher natan lanu et derech hayeshua b'mashiach yeshua. Amen. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who has given us the way of salvation in Messiah Yeshua. Amen. Please stand for the Shema. Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad Baruch Shem Kavon Malkito Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Blessed be the name of his glorious kingdom forever and ever. Amen. Uv lekla kavad derek u shak pakov kumakam Ukshar tam lelta edecha Vahayu le tetevo benenecha Uktav tam zotu beteka u visherekam And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. And these words I command you this day shall be upon your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall speak of them when you sit in your house. When you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you rise up, you shall bind them for a sign upon your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. And you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Amen. Amida, blessed are you, Lord our God, and God of our fathers. God of Abraham, God of Yitzchak, and God of Yaakov, the great, mighty, and awesome God, the Most High God bestows grace and creates all, and remembers the kindness of the fathers, and brings a Redeemer to their children's children, for his name's sake with love. O King, Helper, Savior, and Shield, blessed are you, O Lord, Shield of Abraham. You are eternally mighty, my Lord. The resurrected of the dead are you, abundantly able to save. Who sustains the limb with kindness, resurrected the dead with abundant mercy, supports the fallen, heals the sick, releases the confined, and maintains his faith to those, to those asleep in the dust. Who is like you, O master of mighty deeds? Who is comparable to you, O king? Who causes death and restores life, and makes salvation sprout? Eloheinu, Veohe Avutenu, our God and God of our fathers, may you be pleased with our rest. Sanctify us in your commandments and grant us our portion in your Torah. Satisfy us in your goodness and make us rejoice in your salvation. And purify us to serve you in truth, in love and favor, O Lord our God. Grant us your holy Shabbat as a heritage. And may Israel sanctify your name, rest therein. Baruch atah Adonai, Mekadesh HaShabbat. Blessed are you, O Lord, who makes the Shabbat holy. Kadish, magnified and sanctified 
be his great name in the world which he has created according to his will. May he establish his kingdom during your life and during your days and during the life of the loss of Israel, even swiftly and soon, and all say, Amen. Let his great name be blessed forever and to all eternity, blessed, praised, and glorified, exalted, extolled, and honored, magnified and lauded be the name of the Holy One. Blessed is he, though he be high above all blessings and songs, praises and consolations, which are uttered in the world, and all say, Amen. May you make peace in his high places, make peace upon us and upon all Yisrael, and say, Amen. Yitkadav yitkadash merorbam, bam madira kilti, v'yunik malkadeh b'kai konov yomai konov kai, dekol b'Yisrael. V'aglawiz man karivim ru, Amen. Yesh merorbam, mevarak le'olam o'mei o'maya, yitbarak v'yishtapak, v'yitbarav trumam, Amen. Vibru, Vibru, Amen. Oh, say shalom, Vibru, Mav. Who ya say shalom, Aleinu? Ve'yacho Yisrael. Vibru, Vibru. Yase shalom, yase shalom, shalom aleinu, yako Yisrael. Yase shalom, yase shalom, shalom aleinu, yako Yisrael. Yase shalom, yase shalom, shalom aleinu v'yako Yisrael. Yase shalom, yase shalom, shalom aleinu v'yako Yisrael. May he who makes peace on high places make peace for Israel. And for all mankind, and say, Amen. Yes. 
on the fender's collar. My Redeemer, we remember you just won the war. You should mighty overcome our defender and conqueror. Oh, and listen to the sound of power on our lips. You should you broke the curse. You have never lost a battle. Who are you, great mountain? Then you should not bow low. Yeshua will defeat in the darkness. He has never lost a battle. And all that is within me, Lord. I bless your holy name. I live my life to worship you alone. Oh, you brought me out of darkness and to your glorious light. Forever I will sing of your great love. Forever I will sing of your great love. I love to see glorified, see you lifted high, we yearn to see your nations bow buried, and the hero of you can cause the coldest heart to find your love and everlasting peace, to find your love and everlasting peace. Savior of my soul, 
Your glory, your glory, 
Shabbat, we gather as Mishpacha to hear your word, Father, around your mountain that you might speak your glory, your truth into our lives, Father, that we would just abandon our flesh, Lord, here and come into the spirit to give you the honor and glory that you're due today on this day, the Shabbat day that you have given us that we might rest and be with you, to be refreshed, refilled, recharged, become a new man. We honor you, and we bless you. B'Shem Yeshua HaMashiach, congregation says. Vayhi ben Shoah Aaron. when the ark would travel, Moshe would say, Arise, Lord, let your enemies be scattered. Let them that hate you flee from you, for out of Zion shall go forth the Torah and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Blessed be he who in his holiness gave the Torah to his people, Yisrael. Ya Amod, Yoel, Ben Avraham, La Torah. Baruch et Adonai Hamvarach, Baruch Adonai Hamvarach, Leolam Ba'ed. Baruch et Adonai, Eloheinu melech alam, asher b'char b'nu mikol, ha'amim v'natan lano et torato, Baruch et Adonai, notein ha'torah. Bless the Lord, the Blessed One. Blessed is the Lord, the Blessed One, for all eternity. Blessed are you, O Lord, our God, King of the universe, who has chosen us from all people, given us his Torah. Blessed are you, O Lord, giver of the Torah. Amen. Yeladim. So this is the time in which we invite Hayeladim up front, and we pray a weekly blessing over them. But first we say, Boker Tov, Yeladim. Let us pray. We thank you, O Lord, for these blessed children and the families that they represent. May they be blessed abundantly as Sarah, Rebecca, Rachel, and Leah, Ephraim, and Manasseh. Lord, I ask that you keep a hedge of protection around each and every one of them, and keep them away from harm's way and from sickness, Lord. Lord, I also ask that as they grow and mature in the faith, Lord, that you would draw them near to you when they reach that age of understanding and they will receive you as their Messiah. Lord, I also ask that you surround them with godly men and women during their life's journey. We ask these things in Yeshua's name. Amen. Vaishma Yitro, Kohen Midian, Choten Moshe, et kol asher asa Elohim, le Moshe ul Yisrael, imo ki hotzi Adonai et Yisrael mimitzrayim, vaikach Yitro, Choten Moshe, et zipora eshet Moshe achar, 
שלוחיה ואת שני בניה, אשר שם האחד גרשום, כי אמר גר הייתי בארץ נקריה. When Jethro, the priest of Midian, Moses' father-in-law, heard of all that God had done for Moses and for Israel his people, and that the Lord had brought Israel out of Egypt, then Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, took Zephora, Moses' wife, after he had sent her back, and her two sons, of which the name of the one was Gershom, for he said, I have been an alien in a strange land. Amen. Blessed are you, O Lord, our God, King of the universe, who gave us the Torah of truth and has planted eternal life within us. Blessed are you, O Lord, giver of the Torah. And this is the Torah that Moses placed before the children of Israel at the command of the Lord through Moses' hand. John 1.1 1, 1 says, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. This Torah scroll is the Word of God. Yeshua is this Word. John the Immerser said in John 1.29, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of all the world. God's Word is written on lambskin. Yeshua is this Lamb. In John 12.32, Yeshua said, And I, if I am lifted from the earth, will draw all people to myself. The two wooden poles holding this Torah scroll are called Eitz Chaim, or Tree of Life, Yeshua was sacrificed on two wooden poles some 2,000 years ago for our sins. Amen. Eitz Chaim hi l'makazakim ba'avatum chayam mushar. Drachei dokeinu am v'kol n'tafatecha shalom. Eshaveinu d'nai lecha v'nashuva kadesh yemenu kakadem. There's a tree of life to those who take hold of it. Happy are those who support it. Its ways are ways of pleasantness and all its paths are peace. Cause us to return to you, Adonai, and we shall return, renew our days as of old. Revelation 2, 7 reads, You as an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the congregations, to him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Yeshua was, is, and shall ever be this word of the one living God that we look upon this day for our salvation. Amen. You may be seated. Shabbat Shalom, everyone. So, <clears throat> as all of you should know, the parasha this week um, deals with what could probably be argued as the most important event in the entire Torah, if not the entire Tanakh. And that, of course, is the giving of the law at Mount Sinai given there to the children of Israel, of course, but also, as we know, to the mixed multitude that was among them. It was given through the utterance, or at least that it began with the utterance of the Ten Commandments, or what's known as the Ten Statements. And this came forth from the cloud of thunder and lightning that had settled there on top of the mountain. Now, those of you who have been keeping up with reading the showed each week, and I hope everyone has been doing so, you recall that over the last couple of weeks, we've read how Israel has been liberated from um, their bondage under Pharaoh in Egypt, how they cross unharmed through the Red Sea, how they were fed quail and manna in the wilderness, and how they were given victory over the Amalekites. And then after all of these events, 
all of these miraculous um, occurrences that God was reaching out his hand and showing his power, making his name known to the children of Israel, but even to the Egyptians and all the nations around them. Finally, now, God brings them to the foot of Sinai, and he does so in order to establish a covenant with them. And as an aside, real quickly here, just as a reminder to those of you who might be interested, um, many, certainly from the yeshiva class, but also others, um, are going to be watching a documentary this Tuesday evening. Um, it runs from 7 to 9.30. It's in many of the theaters that are out there. And it's going to cover these events, but specifically the events leading up to the crossing of the Red Sea. It's actually a two-part documentary. The first part is this coming Tuesday. The second part of it um, will be in early May, and we'll be going to that as well as a group. Um, but I'd encourage all of you to think about um, attending this documentary if you're free. Um, it's called Patterns of Evidence, the Red Sea Miracle. Um, again, it's not playing in every theater out there, but many, low, many are playing. It's a one-night showing, one-time showing, if you want to catch it. Um, I looked in Montrose and in Cuyahoga Falls, the theater's there. Um, there. It is playing at both those locations. It's about $12 to $14 a ticket. If you want to know more about that documentary, um, about who's going, uh, where they're going, see me or Brian after service. I think Brian will be making an announcement at the end as well um, regarding this. <clears throat> now, anyone, though, who, when you're thinking about this journey that the Israelites take to get to Sinai after they leave Egypt, if you've ever looked at a map, or if you simply have geographic knowledge of the southeastern Mediterranean world, you, know, you would know that if you were going to make a journey from Egypt up to the land of Canaan, going to Mount Sinai and actually one of the things this documentary is going to touch upon is there's disagreement on where Sinai actually is located, but regardless of what, what options are out there, going to Sinai is not the most direct route. No one who is trying to quickly get out of Egypt and get into the land of Canaan as quick as possible would ever go that route. Now we know, though, that this was intentional, that God leading them to Sinai was intentional. He wasn't looking at taking the children of Israel the, the most direct or the quickest route. And we know it was intentional after all because why did they go to Sinai? Well, they're following the, the, um, the pillar of smoke and fire. They're, they're, they're going after that, that, that cloud in which God's presence was. That's what they were, they were following. But even more so, <clears throat> God leads his people out in the wilderness for specific reasons, and ultimately it's to get, it's so that he can make them his own people. In Exodus 13, 17, we read the following. And it came to pass when Pharaoh had let the people go, that God led them not through the way of the land of the Philistines, although that was near. For God said, lest peradventure the people repent when they see war and they return to Egypt. So God, having freed the children of Israel, he knew their hearts. He knew where their hearts still lay. He knew that having lived in Egypt for hundreds of years, they had grown accustomed to the comforts and the culture and the civilization of Egypt that surrounded them. And that the reality was is even though they, even if they wanted to stay loyal to the God of their fathers of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the reality is, is that they had been affected by the idolatry and the sins of the Egypt, having grown up and lived their entire lives in that culture. They'd witnessed that idolatry for generations. So God had to deal with this. He had to address this if these are going to be his people. And the reality was is that their bondage, their bondage in Egypt, it wasn't just a physical one. It wasn't the physical toil under Pharaoh. That existed, yes, but it was also a bondage to sin that resulted from their hearts and their minds being turned away from the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Now, not entirely, because they knew who to cry out to um, for their salvation. But again, they had been influenced by this culture for hundreds of years. 
Consequently, rather than taking them by what's known as the King's Highway, and this was a well-established road that existed at that time, it was a trade route, it's where the mer merchants would travel back and forth between Egypt and the land of Canaan and beyond, it was also the road in, when, in the, the armies of Egypt when they would go out to fight the Hittites or other nations that um, the armies would use. This ran right along the Mediterranean Sea and it connected Egypt to Canaan. God could have had them go that way, because again, that would have been the quickest route. But instead, he leads them out in the wilderness. And he does so, as we just read, because he does so that they wouldn't seek to return to the perceived safety of their former bondage when war came upon them. And so we see and we read this week that after three months, of, three months after the, their exodus from Egypt, God brought them to the foot of Mount Sinai. Exodus 19, 1 through 2 reads... In the third month, when the children of Israel were gone forth out of the land of Egypt, the same day came they into the wilderness of Sinai. For they were departed from Rephidim, and were come to the desert of Sinai, and had pitched in the wilderness, and there Israel camped before the mount. <clears throat> so having brought the children of Israel here to Sinai, God then seeks to make a covenant with them. Now the question is, what was the purpose for establishing another covenant with Israel. And it's important that you, we realize this is a second covenant that God is establishing with them. Because after all, being the Israelites being the children of the promise, they still had the covenant with Avraham. They already had a covenant with God. This covenant was given to Avraham, and then, it, it, you know, as we read through Genesis, it passes to Isaac, it then passes to Jacob, and then ultimately it passes to all 12 sons of Jacob. And it's the covenant that we heard of when Abraham was first called out in Genesis 12, 2 through 3. And I will make thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great. And thou shalt be a blessing, and I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee. And in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. And this same covenant made with Abraham was further elaborated in Genesis 17, 4 through 13. As for me, behold, my covenant is with thee, and thou shalt be a father of many nations. Neither shall thy name any more be called Abram, but thy name shall be called Avraham. For a father of many nations have I made thee, and I will make thee exceedingly fruitful, and I will make nations of thee, and kings shall come out of thee. And I will establish my covenant between me and thee, and thy seed after thee, and in their generations, for an everlasting covenant to be God unto thee, and to thy seed after thee. And I will give unto thee, and to thy seed after thee, the land wherein thou art a stranger, all the land of Canaan, for an everlasting possession." And I will be their God. And God said unto Abraham, Thou shalt keep my covenant, therefore thou and thy seed after thee in their generations. This is my covenant which ye shall keep between me and you and thy seed after thee. Every man child among you shall be circumcised, and ye shall circumcise the flesh of your foreskin, and it shall be a token of the covenant betwixt me and you. And he that is eight days old shall be circumcised among you, every man child in your generations. He that is born in the house or, brought or bought with money of any stranger, which is not of thy seed. He that is born in thy house and he that is bought within thy, with thy money must needs be circumcised. And my covenant shall be in your flesh for an everlasting covenant. So from what we just read, we see there's three components to this Abrahamic covenant that the children of Israel still held. First of all, God had promised that Abraham would be the father of many nations and he would be the father of a great nation. And the children of Israel are that great nation. Secondly, God promised the land of Canaan to be given to Abraham and his descendants. And again, not just every single descendant of Abraham, but specifically the ones that passed through Isaac and Jacob and then Jacob's sons. And then third that God promised that all nations would be blessed through Abraham, and ultimately the seed of Abraham, which we know to be the Mashiach. So we, we have these three promises here that the children of Israel brought out of Egypt still have. They already have these three promises given to them. And I think most importantly is understanding they had the promise of the land already there. This new covenant that God would be making with them had nothing to do with the land. Now, certainly in this new covenant, we'll see that there's conditions about whether they could stay in that land that God had promised them or not, or would they be disciplined and punished if they broke that covenant that God was about to establish with them. But the promise of the land itself was already there. Now, of course, 
not only do we have these three promises, but we also have to remember the Abrahamic covenant was unconditional, meaning it was a promise of inheritance that couldn't be taken away. It didn't depend on Abraham or any of his descendants fulfilling certain terms or conditions of that covenant. For, and even though, we, as we read there in Genesis 17, we see that there was a command by God to have all males circumcised who were brought in under the covenant, whether that be through birth or it be through becoming attached to, ultimately, the house of Abraham. We see, though, this commandment of male circumcision, it's to be a sign of the covenant. It's not that the covenant was dependent upon it. It's not a condition of the covenant. It's merely a sign of the covenant that God had made with them. And we, heard, and we just heard this in Genesis 17, 11, where God even calls that, that command of the circumcision to, as a token, or some translations may say a sign of the covenant there in Genesis 17, 11. Now, centuries, millennia later, Rav Shaul, the Apostle Paul, would further explain this command of the, of the circumcision being a sign of that covenant. Romans 4, 2 through 12 says, For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath wear off to glory, but not before God. For what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him, unto him for righteousness. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Even as David also describeth the blessedness of the man, unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works, saying, Blessed are, are, the, are they whose iniquities are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. Cometh this blessedness upon the circumcision only, or upon the uncircumcision also? For we say that faith is reckoned to Abraham for righteousness. How was it reckoned? When he was in circumcision or in uncircumcision? Not in circumcision, but in uncircumcision. And he re received the sign of circumcision, a seal of righteousness of the faith, which he had yet been uncircumcised, that he might be the father of all them that believe, though they be not circumcised, that righteousness might be imputed unto them also. And the father of circumcision to them who are not of the circumcision only, but also walk in the steps of the faith of our father Abraham, which he hath been yet uncircumcised. So Paul <clears throat> makes it clear here that these promises of God, these three promises that were given through this covenant that he made with Abraham, they did not depend on the act of circumcision. Rather, the covenant was given as a result of Abraham's faith in God which was then counted to him as righteousness. This command of circumcision came only after that covenant had been made already with Abraham. It served only as a sign or a token of the righteous faith in God's promises that Abraham was, had already and was already demonstrating in his life. And likewise, for the, for the Israelites at Sinai, for the followers of Yeshua in the first century whom Paul is addressing, and for those of us here today, those of us who trust in the righteous faith and the promises of God, mediated to us through Yeshua, this covenant remains with us unconditionally. Therefore, we can say with confidence that God's covenant with Abraham remained with the children of Israel, whom he had freed from Egypt and now who, and now who stood at the foot of Sinai. So despite their time in Egypt as the servants of Pharaoh, and as I'm going to build and show, also becoming servants of sin, despite that, they still have this covenant with God and they still have the promises of God. And we can see further this unconditional covenant remained with Israel in the words that Moshe himself spoke in Exodus 6, 2 through 8. And God spake unto Moses and said unto him, I am the Lord, and I appeared unto Abraham, unto Isaac, and unto Jacob by the name of God Almighty, but by my name Jehovah was I not known to them. And I have also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan, the land of their pilgrimage, wherein they were strangers. And I have also heard the groanings of the children of Israel, whom the Egyptians kept or keep in bondage. And I have remembered my covenant. Wherefore, say unto the children of Israel, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. And I will rid you out of their bondage, and I will redeem you with a stretched out arm and with great judgments. And I will take you to me for a people, and I will be to you a God. And ye shall know that I am the Lord your God, which bringeth you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. 
And I'll bring you into the land concerning which I did swear to give to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. And I will give it to you, to you for an heritage. I am the Lord. So they're, they're clearly God referencing even before he begins to visit the ten plagues on the Egypts, before all the miracles of bringing them out of Egypt and delivering them from their bondage. God is recalling He's evoking that covenant that he had made with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He's showing that that covenant still stood. And that's the very reason that he's willing to hear the cry of the Israelites. And he's willing to bring them out of Egypt. He's willing to set them free because he had promised to do so. So if the Abrahamic covenant remained with Israel... We then have to ask ourselves, what is the purpose of this new covenant that God's making with them at Sinai? Why do we need the Mosaic covenant? Why is there this need for a second covenant, an additional one? Not one that replaces or annuls it, and that's a whole other teaching, but a second covenant that builds upon it. Why does God need to make more promises to Israel? The answer is given by God in Exodus 19, 3 through 6. And Moses went up unto God, and the Lord called out unto him out of the mountain, saying, Thus shalt thou say to the house of Jacob, and tell the children of Israel, Ye have seen what I did unto the Egyptians, and how I bare you on eagles' wings, and brought you unto myself. Now therefore, if ye will obey my voice indeed, and keep my covenant, then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine. And ye shall be unto me a kingdom of of priests and an holy nation." These are the words that thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. Now those words are important because ultimately that's the promise of the, new cov- or of the Mosaic Covenant. When you, when you think about that each covenant contains a promise by God, you should always ask yourself, well, what is the promise of that covenant? This, in essence, right here is the promise of the Mosaic Covenant. There's a lot of other promises that are made in it. And, we, you know, we, do, we read whole Torah sections, we do whole, te- whole teachings. When we get to Leviticus and we get to Deuteronomy about the blessings and the curses and all the promises there. But those are all about the conditions of the covenant being made. Ultimately, what's the, what is the promise, though, that God's making of this covenant? It's found right here. And it's that, that God desired to lift the Israelites above all the other nations of the world and make them a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. That's the promise. I promise to make you a kingdom of priests and a holy, a set-apart nation. Now, that begs the question, of course, or raises the question of, what then is the role of a priest? If, if, if Israel is to become this nation of priests, what are they supposed to do? What does a priest do? And ultimately, of course, a priest is one who serves God. And we can look at the Levitical priesthood for an indication of, well, how do they go about serving God in this unique role? What do the Levitical priests do? Well, they served in the tabernacle, and then ultimately in the temple. And, they, and what did they do? Well, they made sacrifices... They made offerings for, on behalf of the people to God, and they guarded the holiness of the tabernacle. That, separate, that separatedness of God from the Israelites that had to exist because of, sin, uh, um, because of the sin nature of man, the priests were there as, as kind of the guards to make sure that that separation always stayed in place. So through these two functions, the priests acted ultimately as mediators between God and man. That's ultimately the role of a priest. The priest is a mediator, one who stands between God and man in God's relationship to man. A perfect example of this function is seen by the high priest. When you think about him on Yom Kippur, what would he do? He would enter into the Holy of Holies to present present the atoning sacrifice that year for all of Israel. Adorning the priestly garments which were filled with physical representations of Israel. Think of like the breastplate and the 12 stones, one for each tribe of Israel. He goes into the presence of God on behalf of the entire nation. Essentially, he stands before God as Israel on that day in order to seek an atonement for the sins. Another example of this mediator role could be seen in Moshe himself as the one individual who spoke directly to God who would hear the instructions of Torah and then would give it to the Israelites. We're going to read some verses here in a bit. The Israelites could not hear directly from God. They were too terrified of his voice. They 
who cried out, we are going to die because we hear his voice. They needed that mediator between God and um, themselves in order to be able to hear what God's instructions were. This is also played out, this role of mediator, um, when the Israelites would bring before the priests their most difficult disagreements. When they would have disagreements that couldn't be decided by the elders in their local, in, the, in, the, in their clan or in their family or in their tribe, they were commanded to go then to, um, they would go before the king or they would go before the priest and they would receive a judgment on how do we apply Torah in this situation? How do we carry out the instructions and the commandments of God when there's a disagreement? They would go be, before the priest because the priests were serving as a mediator for God in those, in those decisions. This would play out certainly after Moshe, but you know, a perfect example is um, in Numbers, the man who is gathering sticks on the Sabbath. Well, we don't know what to do with this guy. He's clearly violating the law, but what do we do? So they take him before Moses. Moses has to be the mediator. He's there in place of God to make a judgment. Now we recall Moses wasn't even sure what to do, so he has to ask God, and God then um, tells them what tells them to carry out the punishment of stoning because he had violated this commandment. So thus, as a nation of priests. The Israelites in this new covenant would be responsible for serving God and protecting his sacredness, protecting his holiness. And they would do this by serving as a mediator between God and all the other nations of the earth. Paul refers to this responsibility held by the Jews in his own day when he wrote the following in Romans 2, 17 through 20. Behold, thou art called a Jew, and restest in the law, makest thou boast of God, and knowest his will, and approvest the things that are more excellent, being instructed out of the law. And thou art confident that thou, sh thou thyself art a guide of the blind, a light of them which are in darkness, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of babes, which has the form of knowledge and of the truth in the law. So right there, Paul is talking about the role that the Jews should be fulfilling. Now you keep going, Romans, and he talks about how you failed in doing this. But he's saying this is our role. We're to be, we're the ones who have received God's instructions, and therefore we're to be the guide. We're to be the light. We're to be the instructor of those who still, who are lacking the knowledge of God. They're lacking the truth in, what does he say, in the law, in the Torah. Furthermore, we see this role, Paul continues, when he speaks about what is the advantage of being a Jew. In Romans 3, 1 through 2, he says, What advantage then hath a Jew? Or what profit is there of uncircum or, uh, or what profit is there of circumcision? Much every way, chiefly because that unto them were committed the oracles of God. The oracles of God, meaning the teachings, the instructions, the revelations of God. These were given to the Jewish people, who then again, as a mediator, are then to share them with the rest of the world. So we see the reason then for God calling out, calling them out to be a holy nation. A people that was set apart from the rest of the nations because God is holy and he is set apart and above all things and he is unlike all things in his creation, then those who are to serve him and represent him to other nations also have to be holy. And this is the whole point of the Mosaic Covenant. This is why Adonai established another covenant with the Israelites at Sinai, the one that we refer to as the Mosaic Covenant. He did this in order to make them a holy people, a nation that would be set apart from all others so that they could serve him as a nation of priests. If they kept this covenant, if they kept the commandments, the instructions, the conditions of the covenant, the, of the Mosaic covenant, then they would, well, the Mosaic covenant would lead the Israelites what would it cause them to do? It would cause them to shed the cultural influences of idolatrous Egypt. Again, they've lived there for hundreds of years. They've been influenced by their thoughts and their manners. If you doubt whether they have or not, the golden calf is a perfect example. They grab, they, what do they go back to when all of a sudden they feel lost and we're disconnected? We've lost Moses. He's gone up the mountain. We don't know what happened to him. They're thinking he's dead. And so what do we do? Well, automatically, they acknowledge the God of Abraham and Isaac is the one who freed him, but let's create this golden calf so we have a physical representation of that God. They go back to those influences. This is what's there. So the covenant here that God now begins to make with the Israelites 
is again, it's to sh cause them to shed, it's to pull off, to peel off these influences, these thoughts, these manners of Egypt, of the world. It would also protect them then against the influence from the wicked and idolatrous nations that were in the land of Canaan, which were they were going to go up and occupy. Throughout their generations, the law would, be, would keep them as a holy people shielded from Egyptian, Canaanite, Assyrian, Babylonian, Persian, Greek, and Roman influences. At least that's what it was supposed to do. And this is why the Torah is often envisioned as a fence. It keeps the sins of the other nations outside of God's holy people while also keeping his people from wandering into such sin. The need for such a covenant, one that would purify and then separate the children of Israel as a holy people, can be seen by the instructions of God to Moshe regarding the children of Israel and their response to Adonai's presence on the mountain. First, God commanded the Israelites to prepare themselves for three days. Exodus 19, 9 through 11 and 14, 15 reads, And the Lord said unto Moses, Lo, I come unto thee in a thick cloud, that the people may hear when I speak with thee, and believe thee forever. And Moses told the words of the people unto the Lord, and the Lord said unto Moses, Go unto the, the people, and sanctify them today and tomorrow, and let, the, let them wash their clothes, and be ready against the third day, for the third day the Lord will come down in the sight of all the people upon Mount Sinai. And Moses went down from the mount unto the people and sanctified the people, and they washed their clothes. And he said unto the people, Be ready against the, against the third day. Come not at your wives. So right there you see, God just couldn't show up. Now, of course, again, he's shown up in the, he's been leading them in the, the, the cloud, the pillar of cloud and fire. But he can't have his, his presence come and rest on the mountain in their midst. Yet. Why? Because they need to purify themselves first. They have to be set apart. They have to be sanctified. So he gives these instructions about doing so. But even despite taking three days to sanctify themselves, washing themselves, abstaining from certain activities and so on to purify themselves, God still goes further and instructs the Israelites not to touch the mountain. Because if they do so, when his presence is there in the cloud, they're going to die. Exodus 19, 12-13 says, and thou shalt set bounds unto the people round about, saying, Take heed to yourselves, that ye go not up into the mount, or touch the border of it. Whosoever touches the mount shall be surely put to death. There shall not a hand touch it, but he shall surely be stoned or shot through. Whether it be beast or man, it shall not live. When the trumpet soundeth long, they shall come up unto the mount. Now again, when you read this, keep in mind what I was talking about just a little bit ago. These are the children of the promise. These are the children who already have a covenant with God through Avraham. But yet, despite still being in covenant with them, they still have to go through a, practice, uh, a process of sanctification, and they still have to keep a certain distance from them, uh, between themselves and God uh, because of their impurity. <clears throat> It's shown here that they are in need of sanctification before God's presence can come and be among them. They are un, they're considered unworthy of touching the mountain. As such, how could such a people, if this is the case, how could such a people serve as a nation of priests then, who would be the ones responsible for guarding the sacredness of God and acting as his mediator between God and the nations? This is why another covenant is necessary. They were in need of a law, they were in need of instruction that would keep them separate from the other nations who were filled with idolatry and sin. And even more to the heart of, my, of the matter, they were in need of a law that would keep them separated from man's nature to sin, which resided in each and every one of them. They needed a law that would protect them against choosing to follow the Yetzer Hurrah and that would instruct them and guide them on how to choose the Yetzer Hatov. The presence of sin resided in the Israelites because even though they're the children of Abraham and they have a covenant with God, they're also the children of Adam. Paul discusses this very issue in Romans 5, 12 through 15. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered the, into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for the, all, that all have sinned. For until, until the law, sin was in the world, but sin was not imputed when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, 
even over them that had not sinned, after the similitude of Adam's transgressions, who was the figure of him that was to come. But not as the offense, so also is the free gift. For if through the offense of one many be dead, much more the grace of God, and by the gift of grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ, hath abounded unto many. So what Paul is showing us here <clears throat> is that before the giving of the law at Sinai, sin existed in the world because of Adam's transgression against God's commandment to not eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And with the entrance of sin, when that transgression occurred, when sin entered in, also death entered into the world as well. And what's important for today's message is that Paul acknowledges that even though death reigned over all from Adam to Moses, so from Adam's transgression up until the giving of the law of Moses, death reigned. But he says sin was not imputed or charged against man. So we still had to pay the penalty, but there isn't this charging of sin against man. In other words, all of mankind sinned before the law, and they had to pay the penalty of that sin, which is death, but sin was not accounted for because there was no law to show them what sin was. In essence, there was an ignorance. We were sinning in ignorance. Thus, when God gave the law to the Israelites at Sinai, the law which if followed would then make them a holy people, the Israelites were also convicted of their sin. At the utterance of each of God's commandments, the sins of the Israelites were suddenly accounted for. And they became aware of their unrighteousness, which they shared with all of humanity, all being the sons of Adam. So they had sin in their lives, but they didn't know that, they, that the sin was there in their lives. They, they suffered the penalty of death, but they didn't know why. The law, therefore, in this sense, acts as a mirror that reveals our true images. By providing the instruction of living a holy life in service to God, it also shows us the unholy life we live and our failure to serve God. As Paul states in Romans 3, 19 through 21. Now we know that, that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them that who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Likewise, Romans 7, 7 states, What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid, nay, I, I had not known sin, but by the law. For I had not known lust, except the law said, Thou shalt not covet. Now the mistake that's made by many in the church is that they contend that since the law shows us our unrighteousness and it shows us our need to trust God and his promises, they get that right, but then they conclude incorrectly that, well, now that we know this, there's no reason to follow the law because it's already served its function. They see the, the function of the law simply is to be as to show us our unrighteousness. And the law does that, but that's not... It's not even the primary function of the law. You could, see, you could argue it's really just a consequence of when we come in contact with the law, which actually has a different purpose. And you see how many Christians use this. They use it to minister to, to Gentiles through fear. You probably have seen, whether pastors, have, pastors teaching on TV, if you've seen it demonstrated, it's often common, you know, they'll, they'll ask the unbeliever, if you were to die tonight, do you know where your soul would serve eternity? And they begin to question, do you think you're actually righteous enough to enter into heaven? And then they start going through the Ten Commandments. They use the law to say, well, the law says thou shalt not murder. Yeshua shows that if you've ever hated anyone in your heart, you're guilty of murder. And they'll ask, have you ever hated someone? Well, everyone's hated someone at their, in their life. They'll ask, of course, you know, you're not to commit adultery. Yeshua says, if you so much as lust after another person, you've committed it in your heart. They'll ask, have you ever lusted over someone, after someone? You know, thou shalt not covet. Have you ever wanted someone else's possessions? We're all guilty of these things. And so they use this to show the unrighteousness of the person and the need for some type of mediators and some, some, some act, um, 
to fix this problem, which Yeshua does that, but they see the law as only functioning that way. They never, then they think, okay, now it showed your unrighteousness, we don't need it anymore. What such an argument misses, though, is what Paul says in verse 21 of chapter 3, which we just read. The law shows us our sin because it is witnessing to the righteousness of God. It is when we see the righteousness of God that we come to recognize the sin that's in our lives. However, rather than taking the church's argument that the law has done its job once it convicts us, what Paul would have understood, because it is because it is what the purpose of the giving of the law at Sinai shows us, is that because the law acts as a witness to Yehovah's righteousness, it provides instruction, it provides guidance to those who follow it, so that they then also can live lives that witness to it. Not only does it show you the need for correction and for, and for solving this problem, that sin reigns in us and that death is over us and that we are bound in sin and death um, by showing God's righteousness, but it also then is to show instruction that you can begin to follow this and you can begin to become a reflection of God's um, righteousness. In other words, when your Christian brother or sister asks you why should a follower of Yeshua keep the law, the answer is that when we live our lives according to God's law, we live lives that witness to God's righteousness. And since we are instructed to walk in the image or in the shadow of Yeshua, who, of course, kept the law, kept Torah perfectly, so should we be striving to do the same in our own lives. Because we would be demonstrating the righteousness of God just as Yeshua did. It's very bizarre that they, that they can acknowledge that we're to walk, we're to become an image of Yeshua. They can acknowledge that Yeshua lived the law perfectly, but they can't put those two together to realize, well, if we're to be like Yeshua, maybe we should be striving to live the law perfectly as well. Now, as we have noted this morning, the wages of sin is death. And that the law shows us and convicts us of our sins. Therefore, when we receive the law, it brings death to us. This is what Paul is saying. Actually, death was already there, but it brings it to our attention. It brings us to our knowledge and our understanding. Therefore, when we receive the law, Paul says it brings death to us. Now, this, of course, is a familiar idea in Christianity, but it's actually found in Judaism as well. In the Talmud, we find the idea presented in, tra in the tract of Shabbat 88b, which says the following. Rav Yeshua ben Levi also said, at each word which went forth from the mouth of the Holy One, now he's speaking of God speaking the Ten Commandments at Sinai. So at each word which went forth from the mouth of the Holy One, blessed be he, the souls of Israel departed. For it is said, my soul went forth when he spake. But since their souls departed at the first word, how could they receive the second word? So when the first commandment came, if their souls departed, meaning they died, that's what he's saying, well, how could they receive the second commandment? He continues, he brought down the dew with which he will resurrect the dead and revive them. As it is said, thou, O God, did send a plentiful rain, thou didst confirm thy inheritance when it was weary. So this image given to us by this ra ra um, ra Rabbi Yeshua ben Levi is that as we read Exodus 20, we should picture the Israelites around Sinai. And as God sp speaks forth each of his commandments, the people die as their trespasses against the commandment becomes accounted for. Thus when God spoke, I am the Lord your God, you shall have no other gods before me, the people would have died. And thus God had to resurrect them in order to give them the next commandment. And after God had spoken the words, thou shalt not have any graven images, graven image or any likeness, they would have died again, only to be resurrected yet again. Now we can't sit here and say that this truly is what happened at Sinai, that they did physically die and resurrect ten times. The reason is because that's not what Torah says. However, we can affirm that regardless of whether or not, regardless of what happened in the physical, this was certainly happening in the spiritual. That each time God spoke these commandments, they died, they spiritually died, and God had to resurrect them again. And we see 
that something like this was going on in the hearts of the minds of the Israelites. Because after hearing God speak forth his commandments from the summit at Sinai, the Israelites had a great fear come over them. And we read the following in Exodus 20, 19. And they said unto Moses, Speak thou with us, and we will hear. But let not God speak with us, lest we die. In hearing these commandments, they understood that they were dying, that the process of death was occurring. And that's why they became fearful. And they're like, we have to have a mediator. We can't hear directly from God. Moses, you go up, speak to him, and then bring back his word to us. So having received the commandments, they understood that their position as sinful people before a holy and righteous God was one that could only bring death. And we likewise hear Paul express the same idea in Romans 7, 9 through 13. For I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. And the commandment which was ordained to life I found to be unto death. For sin, taking occasion by the commandment, deceived me, and by it slew me. Wherefore the law is holy, and the commandment holy, and just and good. Was then that which is good made death unto me? God forbid, but sin, that it might appear sin, worketh death in me by that which is good, that sin by the commandment might become exceedingly sinful. Now Paul here is speaking about himself. And of course, Paul is removed a good 1,500 years from Sinai. But the life that he speaks about, of that before the commandment came, most likely this is him talking about the idea of in his youth, prior to him reaching an, uh, reaching an age of accountability. And if you know within Judaism, it's understood that children prior to their bar bat mitzvah, that they're, they consider them being free from the law. They're not held accountable to it. It's at the bar or bat mitzvah that they then become accountable to it. However, when Paul reached the age of accountability then, he became responsible for keeping God's commandments. And he says, therefore, he died spiritually because in sin he was, because his sin was exposed to him. And sin brought death. This individual experience by Paul would have been the same experience that the Israelites had at Sinai. They lived prior to the giving of the law, but once God spoke the commandments to them, they died as their exposed sins were able to slay them. So if the coming of the law brings death, not because it is bad or it's an unholy thing, but because it reveals our sins to us and makes us accountable to those sins, what hope do we have? What hope does Paul give us if this is the case? Well, Paul speaks of his and our hope in Romans 6, 3 through 7. Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin, for he that is dead is freed from sin. When Paul speaks here of the old man being crucified, he's referring to our likeness to Adam, and that we have sinned and brought death upon us as a result of the transgression. When the law comes forth to us and we die because of our sin, we as the children of Adam die. But in that death, so we receive our freedom from, this, from sin and from its wages. The hope then is the resurrection from that death which, with which Yeshua makes possible. Which even in Judaism is their understanding of what happened at Sinai by that rabbi. Saying God raised them up from their death. Our hope has to rely entirely on, in God and God's mercy that there will be a resurrection from this death, that, that, the, the death that occurs because of being in the image of Adam. Paul could then continues in 6, 8 through 14. Now if we be dead in, with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more, death hath no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin once, but in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. 
Likewise reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal bodies, that ye should obey it in the lust thereof. Neither yield your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield your, yourselves unto God as those that, that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. For sin shall, for sh sin shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under, under the law, but under grace. And here again is where today's church gets things wrong. Believing the statement that we are under grace and not under the law means that we no longer have to follow the law. We no longer have to be concerned with it. Yet if they would simply keep reading right here in Paul's own writings, they would see this is not what Paul taught. Romans 6, 15 through 23 continues. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law but under grace? God forbid, know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. But God be thanked that ye were servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that from the doctrine which is delivered to you. Being then made free from sin, ye became the servants of righteousness. I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. For as, for as ye have yielded your members servants to uncleanness and to iniquity, to iniquity, even so now yield your members servants to righteousness unto holiness. For when ye were servants of sin, ye were free from righteousness. What fruit had ye then in those things whereof ye are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now being made free from sin and to become servants to God, ye have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And when you look at, this is just coming to me, this under the law, but, you know, for ye are not under the law, but under grace. What does grace mean? And this is something that the church really gets wrong often, because they often use grace interchangeably with salvation. But grace doesn't mean salvation. We receive salvation because of God's grace. But it's not the same thing. The Greek word for grace, the Greek word that's used here is charis. Charis means favor. So you're not under God's law, you're under God's favor. But guess what? The Israelites, as I hope I showed this morning, the Israelites were already under God's favor when he brought them to Sinai. He, they had God's favor because... That's the very reason he freed them from their bondage in, in Egypt. He had, they had God's favor because, as we showed, they were already under the Abrahamic covenant. They have God's favor because of Avraham. Well, because of that promise God made to Avraham. Now, but, what did I show you? Even though they had God's favor, they couldn't approach the mountain. They had to sanctify themselves for three days before they could even hear the word of God. They needed something else in order to actually be in the presence of God. The, God's favor alone was not enough. And that's what I think they're really missing. That, that, that's what they're missing. Having died to sin by the law, we are thus resurrected through Yeshua to the what? Why are we resurrected by Yeshua after we die to the law? Because we're to serve righteousness. Just as Joshua ben Levi spoke of God resurrecting the Israelites at Sinai after they had died to each commandment. And to serve righteousness, to serve God, does what? It requires one to keep the law. For as we have seen this morning, the purpose of the law is to make the people of God holy, to set them apart, so that they can then serve God as a nation of priests. They can become the mediators so that they can get closer to God, and now we can actually begin to hear from God. That we not just have blessings given to us because we have his favor, but we actually enter into a more deeper relationship with him, where we actually not just receive things, but now we actually get to hear from God. We're able to speak to God. The idea of being a holy people unto God through Yeshua is echoed in the passage we, passages we just heard from Paul when he says we should yield our members to righteousness and to holiness. 
Well, what does that mean? How do we know what righteousness and holiness is? The law is what tells us that. We see the same understanding also in the writings of Peter, where he echoes the words of God to Moshe and the Israelites that were at Sinai. 1 Peter 2, 5 through 10 says the following. Ye also, as lively stones, are built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices accept, acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Wherefore also it is contained in the scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. Unto you therefore which, he, which believe, he is precious. But unto them which, dis, which are dis, disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner. And a stone of stumbling, a rock of offense, even to them which stumble at the word, being disobedient, whereunto also they were appointed. But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, which in time past were not a people, but are now the people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. And so, having received the law, <clears throat> having been shown our unrighteousness, having had our sins accounted for, having died to the law and having been resurrected through Yeshua, let us take these words written by Peter most seriously through the guidance of the Ruach HaKodesh. Let us strive to be a holy people unto God. Let us be a royal priesthood that serves God by guarding his sacredness and by being his mediator to the nations around us. Let us work to adhere and follow the law to the best of our abilities with the help of the Holy Spirit. That's the other part that I'm not getting into this morning, but it could be another teaching. Because we, we all have heard it said, and it's right, no one, are, no one on our own can keep the law perfectly as Yeshua did. And we won't do it now, even though we've been resurrected through Yeshua's death and resurrection, we have been resurrected to now be a set-apart people to serve righteousness and holiness and to demonstrate it, to reflect it. But what, what is different is we now have the Ruach. We have the Holy Spirit. And the more we open ourselves to the Holy Spirit, the more we yield to it and let it guide us, the more we are going to be able to live out that law. When we, when we in, as followers of Yeshua, who have died and been raised... Still waiting for the physical, but spiritually, that should have occurred in us. If you belong to Yeshua, that should have occurred. He's giving you a comforter. He's giving you one who will strengthen you. And if you follow that, the Spirit, you demonstrate the fruits. There's no law against the fruits. As we know, we will carry out the law perfectly. It's only when we decide... Because we still have the flesh fighting within us. And Paul gets into this in Romans 7. I'm going well beyond today's teaching. But I think it's important to think about in all of this. When you violate the Torah today, it's because, not because you are in the image of Adam and you sin. It's because you're not following the direction of the Holy Spirit in your life. You've decided in that moment, in that situation, to shut yourself off to the Holy Spirit and let the flesh come back to life in essence. But if you don't do that, if you continue to pursue obedience and sub submission to the Holy Spirit, you will find that, you, that incl those inclinations that we still carry in our flesh to sin, they're going to diminish more and more and more. That's the process of sanctification. And let us live our lives as best we can, again, to be, to be those priests that God calls us to be. To protect his sacredness and his holiness. But also to be that mediator, be that ambassador to go out into the world and represent God to the nations. If you continue to live life as you did before, if you continue to violate the Torah, you're not going to be a witness to God. Because you're not witnessing to his righteousness and his holiness. You may be witnessing to something else, Maybe a blurred vision of God, maybe um, some corrupted image of God, but it won't be to God himself. Only by following Torah are you going to be able to do that. 
It is our duty to praise the master of all, to ascribe greatness to the author of creation. For he made us unlike the nations of the lands, has not placed us like the families of the earth. He's not made our portion like theirs and our lot like all their multitudes. And we bend the knee and bow and acknowledge our thanks before the king over kings, the holy one, blessed be he. He stretches out heaven and establishes earth's foundation. And the seat of his glory is in the heavens above and the presence of his power is in the most exalted heights. He is our God, there is none other. True is our king, there is nothing beside him. As it is written in his Torah, and you shall know this day and take to your heart that the Lord, he is God in the heavens above and on the earth below, there is none other. Amen. Lord, there is love. 
continue to mold us and shape us into the people that you've called us to be, Lord, to, to put your plumb line in front of us and before us, and we, you would hold our hand and that your spirit would guide us, Lord, along the path of righteousness, Lord, as we continue to work out our faith, fear and trembling, and seek your truth and follow your ways and your Torah and your commands. For every one of us, Lord God, that misses the mark, Lord, we ask that you continue to hold us and guide us, Lord, and forgive us of all of our sins that we commit in your sight. We honor you. We bless your name. In Kamok Adonai, Hashem Shem Amen. Maybe see it for announcements. As always, please check the back table. We have our CDs back there. As well as on the back table, we have uh, the sign-up list for Pesach this year. Again, as I've been announcing, it's going to occur April 8th, which is a Wednesday night. We'll begin at 6.30. I also put an invitation on Facebook, so I encourage you to go out there to uh, show that you're going, you're going to the uh, event, and then if you would like to share it, you know, feel free to share it. Obviously, uh, it helps to get it out there on Facebook for people to see that we're having our annual Pesach. It's going to be at the Sheraton Hotel again, um, so please sign up. All the meals are going to be the same. All the amount of money is going to be the same, so if you have any questions, uh, let me know. Also, I, as uh, Rabbi Stephen uh, talked about today, uh, we are going on Tuesday evening, uh, going to the Fairlawn uh, Movie Theater to see Patterns of Evidence. It's going to be at 7 o'clock to 9.30. We already have about four or five people going there, so if you want to come to the Fairlawn Movie Theater and join us, that'd be awesome. Um, we can talk about af that after service. We can coordinate uh, who's going and, and uh, what time we want to meet up so we can all uh, sit together. Also, uh, bat, the Bat Mitzvah class for Hebrew will begin at 2 o'clock today, so please see Kathy in the back at 2 o'clock, and that's when uh, Bat Mitzvah, uh, the he you'll be learning Hebrew. Uh, did you have anything to add as it relates to parents ovens okay uh, and then obviously yeshiva we don't have yeshiva this week but yeshiva will start again the following week so not this wednesday but next wednesday we're going to start up you know awesome 
All right, if, and Aaron, just in case someone in the uh, Oneg room, we're gonna, we have another blanket for the women to pray over. So after we get done with announcements, come up front and uh, pray over the blanket. And every, yes, and as always, if everyone else can uh, move uh, quite quickly out of the room, or if you have to stay in here, if you could uh, be quiet while the ladies pray over the blanket, that'd be awesome. Uh, as we go into Oneg, just a reminder that the Zadaka box and backs for ties, offerings, donations, one along the side to my left is your praise reports and prayer requests. But as we go into Oneg, let's say the bracha together. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam HaMotzi Lech Amin HaRaretz BaShem Yeshu HaMashiach Amen Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the Universe, who brings forth bread from the land, named Yeshu the Messiah. Amen. Shavuot Tov!